This is called Flowers, Daffodils, Walking Around in Nature and Stuff. <laughs> Just kidding. It's called The First Word. Once I asked my ancient history class when we were studying the dawn of human civilization what they thought the first thing we needed a word for was. What was it that someone once pointed to and said, or rather thought, or grunted, but somehow meant, <clears throat> this, we need special word for this that means only this. So from now on, whenever I make this noise, let's all agree that we mean this. What was that this? For a moment, everyone was lost in prehistoric thought. Everyone except for Evan, who was just plain lost, I realized, when he raised his hand and suggested perhaps it might have been mumuka. And everyone laughed, and Tiffany said, no, not the word, silly. What was the thing the word was for? And Evan said he had no idea, to which Oliver replied, you never do, which is why we love it every time you raise your hand. And I said, hey, now, and Evan said, wait, what? We wondered even what part of speech it was. Was it a verb or a command, like run, perhaps a pronoun like me or you, or an adjective like hungry? Oliver suggested it might have been a simple sentence, me, hungry, for you. And we all laughed because we knew that was wrong, but probably not by much. No, we all agreed it must have been a noun. But was it a person, a place, a thing, or a tool? Gabriel suggested maybe sun, and we all looked out the window instinctively while we continued to think. Tanya admitted that it probably wasn't love, even though love must have existed long before we even had a word for it, or else she said, let's face it, everyone in this room would have died a million years ago. Everyone knew what she meant, so no one questioned her math. And what followed was one of the greatest discussions I have ever witnessed as a teacher. We talked about the things we need as humans. We have always needed to survive, and which came first? Things like heart, food, fire, weapon, shelter, water, tiger, blood, death, darkness, child, loyalty, and then suddenly Catherine said she knew what it was. Please tell me I was right, said Evan. Was it mumuka? No, but you were close, said Catherine. The word was the same as the thing it was, and the word was mama. And there was nothing more to say after that. <clears throat> uh, this is called 10 Things I've Learned Since Leaving the Classroom that I hope are still true, or why I will always have a job as a poet as long as anyone is told that they are too smart to become a teacher. Raise your hand if at one point before you decided to become a teacher, somebody gave you some advice and said, don't do that, you're too smart to become a teacher. I'm always dismayed at how many hands go up when I ask that question. 10 things I've learned since leaving the classroom that I hope are still true, or why I will always have a job as a poet as long as anyone is told they are too smart to become a teacher. One. One. Two, if you're having trouble starting at the beginning, then don't start there. Start. Uh, Start with the part you know by heart. Start in the middle or start at the end. There are such things as skill and craft and art. Just don't be that person who never begins because they don't know where to start. Three, sometimes you need to do things in an order that only you understand. Eight, <laughs> the most important lessons are worth learning again and again. Eight, the most important lessons are worth learning again and again. 
Five, there are teachers who dazzle from the front of the classroom and others who coach quietly from the back. The first kind tends to get most of the attention, but the second kind do just as good a job. There are also teachers who suck. <laughs> Literally, they suck the joy and the curiosity out of children and they must be stopped. We must get them out of the teaching profession. Six, I might be more useful to the teaching profession outside the classroom than I was when I was in it. But then again, I might be a better poet than I ever was a teacher. We will never know, and I am okay with that. Seven, if you want to raise students' test scores in reading and math, don't cut funding for music, art, drama, and dance. It just doesn't work that way. The arts are not like the ice cream that you only get as a reward after you finish the vegetables of your more important subjects. I don't understand why that is. It just is, and I'm okay with that. Eight, the most important lessons are worth learning again and again. Nine, Business consultants will tell you that if you t can't test something and measure it, then you don't really know what it is. And I'm sure that's true in business. But what if you really don't know what something is? What do you measure? What can you test? Is it so bad not to know what something is, but still have faith that it works, even though you aren't sure why? Does that sound too much like prayer? Talk to me when you know how to measure curiosity, safety, hunger, and the sheer love of learning. Last I heard, there was no test yet for joy. Four, go back and fill in the holes. Check your work. Make it strong. Life is tough. Polish what first you left rough. One, don't ever tell anyone they are too smart to become a teacher. We need the very best of you, and it is not important if your students like you. What is important is that you love them, especially if you don't like them. And finally, 10, I may have left the classroom, but there hasn't been a day that I have not still taught. Everyone is a teacher, every hour, every minute. In fact, this auditorium is my classroom, and I love you, and that means you're in it. Thank you. I just want to put in a pitch for Rona Alexander, the graphic, uh, what do you say? What is it called? Graphic recording. Graphic recording. So this will be posted somewhere. I see, oh, the first word seems like it's coming from a flower. Is this when I said I was going to talk about flowers and walking around nature? Yep, I yep. was on it. You were on it? Good. All right. Well, I'm going to try to mess with you a little bit later. <laughs> I'm going to end with a poem about, called the, the, the Impotence of Proofreading, which is the only thing harder than doing a graphic rec uh, recording of it is the people who try to sign it, the sign language interpreters. I'm reading a couple of new poems. I've divided my remarks this morning into four sections, and uh, the first one is uh, the absolutely new poems that will be going in my new book coming out this fall called uh, Late Father, poems about my own late father and about becoming a father uh, relatively late in life. Uh, my first child was born when I was almost a month shy of 50, and I'm now 53, so I have a three-year-old and an 11-month-old daughter, I who thought I would never have children. And this, this poem is called um, Benevolent Neglect. You are an excellent mother, except for those times when the best parenting practice calls for a kind of benevolent neglect, which is my specialty. So when our baby son has been nursed and changed and comforted, but it is still only 4.15 in the morning, <laughs> you pass the baby video monitor over to me, and I turn it off. Raise your hand if you're thinking to yourself, video monitor? We didn't have video monitors when my children were born. They were called a mother's ears. <laughs> my mother-in-law is like, 
<laughs> video, I can't believe you have a video monitor. You pass the video monitor over to me and I turn it off, almost. There's an LED display along the top which will continue to indicate silently how much noise he is making. Green dots for incidental quiet burps and sneezes, orange for louder, lonely protestations, and red for full-on wails of outrage. But if I close my eyes, I can easily continue to dream that I am an excellent father. At 7 o'clock, I wake to see that there is no more noise coming from the nursery, so I sneak a peek at the video feed to confirm that our child is still actually there and has not been snatched out of his crib by kidnappers, which, as any new parent knows, could totally happen. <laughs> he is there, out cold, surrounded by his animals. But he could be dead. Again, a real possibility, which also could explain the silence. So I continue to watch him on the video monitor until I see him twitch in his slumber because I am an excellent father. And then I turn up the volume on the monitor. Even as I switch off the video again, I bring it close to my ear on my pillow and I listen to the sound of silence in his room. Any time now is an acceptable waking hour. So when I hear the little coos, toots, pops, and hoots that mean he is awake again, and this time for good, I rise and dress before the timber of his wail becomes dis distressed. I make tea and go into his room, basking in the lambent chapel of his smile. I lift him out of his crib, change him, singing, and we walk to the big window which looks out over the street, and we say hello to Brooklyn. Good morning, tree. Good morning, taxi cab, an armored car. Look at the big truck going by. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. My tea is hot. My sun is warm. We share a banana and talk until you wake and come to join us. Thank you. Here's the last poem, last new poem uh, that's going in, Late Father. And, I, and it's called When I Miss Teaching. People often ask me when I, if I miss teaching, and the answer is every day, all the time. Well, not all the time. For instance, never before eight in the morning unless it was that hour before the students were allowed into the building, that empty hour when my classroom, when I had my classroom to myself and I could straighten the desks and chairs in such a way that maybe this time they would stay that way. I loved that time. <laughs> and I miss it. And although in autumn I miss the first day of the year, I never miss teaching on a Monday, which is not the same thing. Unless I would be introducing a new project that I knew would set everyone on fire with curiosity. Or real fire. <laughs> but I never miss teaching in the starving hour before lunch, nor the sluggish hour after. And needless to say, I never miss teaching during lunch, except that the last school where I worked actually had really good food, and everyone knew it even though they pretended it was terrible, and now I'm hungry, and hunger makes me miss teaching. I never miss teaching the period after gym, or walking into a classroom after a class that has just had gym. I think it's safe to say that I do not miss the smell of teaching ever except for rubber cement, <laughs> new books, and magic markers. I never miss teaching on Friday, except those Fridays when half a dozen of us would meet at a bar after school, <laughs> promise we wouldn't spend the whole evening talking about our students, and then talk about absolutely nothing else because we loved our students so much, even the ones we didn't particularly like, 
And what's better than talking about what you love while drinking beer? (laughs) I never miss the bells of teaching, neither the first bell signifying the end of class, which we call the ding, nor the second bell five minutes later announcing the start of the next class, which we call the dong, except when I knew they were coming and was ready for them. Say, I had done everything I planned to do in class for once, answered all the questions about the homework, glanced at my watch, saw that the ding was coming in 10 seconds, and then said, well, maybe I should dismiss you early this one time. Ding! I missed the laughter of my students when I tricked them into working so hard they lost track of time. I never missed the heartbreak of teaching nor its tears, nor its drudgery, but the light bulbs, the wide eyes, the birthdays and the cupcakes, the front row seat of the mind as someone thinks about what they think and how to express it in words. I miss that part of teaching all the time, every day. I brought with me three books and 33 more copies than just three, but my three poetry, three of my poetry books and several sets of a pro- something called Metaphor Dice, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. And you can, uh, you can get them at the book table that is going to be staffed by Temple uh, Rosenberger uh, after the reading. Temple, who said to me, I was so excited to find out that they got you to be the guest, the keynote speaker. I saw you read in Las Vegas a few years ago, and your book is the only book I have ever bought. (laughs) I tried to get her fired on the spot. (laughs) I don't think she meant it like that. This is called The Miracle Workers, and I might know it by heart. Sunday nights, I lie in bed awake, as all teachers do, and wait for sleep to come, as though sleep were the last student in my class to arrive. My grading is done, my lesson plans are in order, and still sleep wanders the hallways like middle school band practice. I'm a teacher, this is what I do. Like a builder builds or a sculptor sculpts, a preacher preaches and a teacher teaches. We are experts in the art of explanation. I know the difference between the questions to answer and the questions to ask. That's an excellent question. What do you think? If two boys are fighting, I break it up. But if two girls are fighting, I wait until it's over, and then I drag what's left to the nurse's office. I'm not your mother. I'm not your father. I'm not your jailer. I'm not your torturer. I'm not even your biggest fan in the whole wide world, even though sometimes I act like all of these things. I know you can do these things that I make you do. That's why I make you do them. I'm a teacher, and that's what we do. We're miracle workers. Once in a restaurant when the waiter said, can I bring you anything else? And I said, no, thank you, just the check, please. And he said, oh, come on, how about a look at the new dessert menu? I knew I had become a teacher when I said, what did I just say? (laughs) Please don't make me repeat myself. In the quiet hours of the dawn, I write my assignment sheets, and then I print them without spell checking them because I'm a teacher and teachers don't make spelling mistakes, do they? (laughs) So as a matter of fact, the new school dress code (laughs) will affect all members of the 5th, 6th, and 78th grades. And if you need an extension on your essays examining the pubic wars (laughs) from a hysterical perspective, you may have only until 
January 331st. I hope that's not a problem for anybody. I like to lecture on love. I like to speak on responsibility. At the drop of a hat, I will talk about honor and integrity and the importance of telling the truth always. And when my students say, Mr. Molly, are we going to be responsible for this? I say, if not you, then who? You think my generation's going to be responsible for this? We're the ones who got you into this mess. Now you are our only hope. And when they say, what we meant, Mr. Molly, is are we going to be tested on this? I say, every single day of your lives. (laughs) Once, while a student of mine was digging in her backpack for a pen, I put on the corner of her desk a pen. But she didn't see me do it. So when I walked to the other side of the classroom and she raised her hand, still not seeing the pen that I had put on the corner of her desk, and said, Mr. Molly, do you mind if I borrow a pen from you? I went, (laughs) she still didn't see it. (laughs) I just want to make sure that Rona gets this. No, 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 it's spelled You already possess everything you require to succeed, including a pen. For a second, she still did not see the pen that I had put on the corner of her desk, but said instead, Mr. Molly, you are probably the weirdest teacher I have ever had. Could you please just loan me a pen? Oh, my God! You're a miracle worker. How did you do that? And I wanted to say all I did was give you what I knew you needed before you knew you needed it. So thank you for the compliment. But education is the miracle. I'm just a worker. I'm a teacher. And that's what we do. Thank you. One more One more poem from this book, and this is called Reading Aloud. And it sounds like it's going to be incredibly filthy, but it's not. The night is young. (laughs) Reading Aloud. Uh, Aloud is spelled with a W, so it's as a reading permitted. Although, of course, <clears throat> as a poet, my mentor, Billy Collins, says that poets are people who are not content to mean only one thing at a time. So, yes, of course, I also mean out loud. Maybe I met her in a restaurant. Maybe I met her in a bar. Maybe I saw her while stopped at my stoplight. Stopped at my stoplight. Yeah, my own personal stoplight. That's not part of the poem. That's just 8.01 a.m., Maybe I saw her while stopped at a stoplight driving down the street in my car. And maybe it started out great, like it does with every woman I've dated. Amazingly passionate, amorous lovemaking. Totally caffeinated. But no matter how varied our sex life, eventually, when we're in bed, women always ask me to do the same thing. And it's starting to mess with my head. I feel I'm being used, maybe even abused, Like I'm trapped and she is my captor. She'll be naked on her back and she'll give me a look and say, I want you to read another chapter out loud from that book we're reading. Women always ask me to read to them. They demand it. I have no choice but to spread wide the pages of the book on the nightstand and get busy giving good voice. I used to do voiceovers for Burger King. (laughs) It was, this is not part of the poem, it's just a little background story (laughs) about my voice. I had a former student whose father was the creative director for an advertising agency, and they had Burger King as a client. And Burger King changes the voice, if not the tagline, on their commercials every year or so. And so in New York, when you live in New York, nobody has a demo reel anymore. That's just not everything they want to find out about you, they can find out on a a website somewhere. And also, 
if a, if a company wants to audition 100 people, five calls to five different agents can arrange to have 100 people, all fitting the same demographic, showing up at the same casting uh, office in the Flatiron District of Manhattan, five minutes apart, just the next day. And I could tell when I would go to a voiceover audition, I could tell who was there for the audition because it would be another white guy just like me. And the audition would start in the elevator. Everybody gets in the elevator, including normal people who are not going to this audition. And one guy from the side of the elevator where the buttons were not would say, could someone please make sure that eight is pressed? And then the guy standing right next to the buttons will say, it has already been pressed. And like, oh, the, the, the men are competing already in there. Anyway, for 10 months, I, may, I said, uh, when you have it your way, it just tastes better. Burger King, offer available for a limited time only. Price and participation may vary. <laughs> Women always ask me to read to them. They demand it. I have no choice but to spread wide the pages of the book on the nightstand and get, bu get busy giving good voice because once upon a time we grew up on stories and the voices in which they were told. We need words to hold us, for the world to behold us, for us to truly know our own souls. So I read them the Chronicles of Narnia and the education of Little Tree, and they close their eyes and listen as I did when these stories were read to me. All of my siblings and all of our friends, sometimes it was quite a crowd, would gather and listen to my mom or dad as they began to read out loud. A different voice for every princess, every knight, and all of the dragons. When my mom read Tolkien, you could tell the difference between Frodo and Bilbo Baggins. We spent so much time reading out loud on long drives or nestled in reading nooks. Much of the man that I am today was influenced by all the good books that my mother and father read to me when I was no more than a child. So I know why the caged bird sings, and I know the call of the wild. Charlotte's Web, Watership Down, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, The Diary of Anne Frank, A Wrinkle in Time, and The King Must Die. Read to your children. All of the time, novels and nursery rhymes, autobiographies, even the newspaper. It doesn't matter. It's quality time because once upon a time, we grew up on stories and the voices in which they were told. We need words to hold us, for the world to behold us, for us to truly know our own souls. <clears throat> that was the first poem that rhymed today, right? I think so. But rhyme is important to me. And I'm going into the third section where I'm going to read a couple of poems from this book called Bouquet of Red Flags. And the first is called <clears throat> My Deepest Condiments. And this is more indicative. This was my first book from 2002. <clears throat> and this is more indicative of the kind of rhyming poetry that I will write nowadays. It rhymes, but not regularly. That was written in irregular rhyming couplets. This isn't even written in that, although it is written in five-line stanzas. <coughs> I'm more likely to have a, a form to the lines than a recognizable pattern to the rhyme scheme. My deepest condiments. I send you my deepest condiments was in no way what my old friend meant to say or write or send. The night she penned a note to me one week after my father died. Not condolences or sentiments. Instead, no, she sent me her deepest condiments as if the dead have need of relish, mustard or ketchup on the other side. And oh, the word made me laugh so hard out loud it hurt so wonderfully absurd, and such a sweet relief 
at a time when it seemed that only grief was allowed in after my father's death. Sweet and simple laughter, which is nothing more than breath brought up from so far deep inside so many years, it often brings up with it tears. And so I laughed and I laughed until my sides were sore. And later, I think I may have even cried a little more. This poem comes from a story that I was told, but it's always better to make the poem as if it were written from your perspective. But a friend said that her husband had written a condolence email to a colleague who had just lost his father. She came home and said, did you write that email to Dave? He said, yeah, I think I did a good job. You can check it in the sent folder. She read it and said, oh, honey, honey, no. He's like, what? She said, you said we send you, Barbara and I send you our deepest condiments. And he said, yeah, isn't that what we, oh no, <laughs> that's the mustard. What is it I mean? She's like, you meant condolences. He's like, hit unsend. She's like, you haven't been able to do that since 1999, unsend. So they go to the funeral and they go up to Dave and he goes, Dave, I just, I want to apologize because there was an awkward misspelling. And the poor grieving son goes, stop. That was the best <laughs> condolence, excuse me. That was the best condiment letter, excuse me. That was the only condiment letter that I received, and it made me laugh. And in the depths of my laughter, I found a, a reservoir of tears that I thought I had cried, but did not. One more poem from this book, and it is called Magnifies an Object Ten Times. Magnifies an Object Ten Times is what it clearly said on the handle of the magnifying glass that my father received on his fifth birthday. He took it as a warning. The birthday gift would work its magic only 10 times and no more, <laughs> becoming after that just a small round window with no miracle, a toy giant's monocle, a circle of simple glass. And so he went about his days with curious thrift, weighing how much he needed to see any part of the world up close, observing as best he could with his own eyes first, thinking, do I need to see that dead bug big, that dandelion, that blade of grass, that wriggling moth in the spider's web? I can imagine most of nature's gifts and crimes, best not to use one of my ten precious times. He lost count of how many miracles he had left. And for weeks after, half expected the magic of the glass to simply stop. And I have asked him to tell me of the thrilling moment he realized or was told that 10 times in this context simply meant tenfold and not 10 instances, but he cannot remember. Likewise, the joy that must have come from such an infinite epiphany. But what he does recall and says he most misses still is the way the magic made him see the world the rest of the time, not through the glass, but all the time he thought the magic would not last. I do this now full time. I was a teacher, depending on, people often ask me, do you still teach? Are you still a teacher? And I know they don't mean the question to be interpreted as a dagger, but that's how I feel sometimes because the answer is not in the way that you mean, but yes, every day. Because I don't, I don't get to see the same kids anymore. I don't get to see the change between August and June. You know, the, we, the kids come back after the summer and we think that they've changed so much in three months or 12 weeks. But the truth is, we're with them for nine months and they change more in front of our eyes. 
And if you, if you calibrate your eyes for that change, you can see it. The way you can, you can see a minute hand move if you breathe slow enough. I have never stared at an hour hand to see whether I could see whether an hour hand moves, but I probably have told people that I have. That's the kind of story that I would make up. So if you count, if you count the 18 years that it's been since I've had health insurance, through my job, plus the nine years that I was a classroom teacher before that. Then I guess I've been teaching 27 years. But if you don't count that, because I haven't had to deal with drunk parents at Christmas parties. I've been the drunk parent at Christmas parties now. Then, then it's been 18 years since I taught, and I only taught for nine years. So if for 18 years I've been traveling the world on the back of poetry and teaching students, teachers, whoever will listen, how to write poems, how to present poems. And it was during one of those, I often get presented with students who don't really want to be there. Sometimes it's three hours I get with the same students, and they'll give me uh, one class for three hours, and then I get them the next day for another three hours. That's the best. That's the best. But schools don't want to waste the visiting writer on the same group of lucky kids. They want to spread you as thinly as possible, like icing. So you know, often I'm just there. I, ha I teach six workshops of 45 minutes to 100 kids each which is ridiculous. And sometimes I'm confronted with a student who has her hands crossed, and I say, what? Are you not excited about this? And she's like, I'm really more of a math science person. And it was in speaking with one such student that I said, well, that's OK. Did you know that a metaphor is really just an equation between two nouns? And her eyes perked up. And I said, yeah, it's true. A metaphor is a way of saying, temporarily, let x equal y. Let th this be equal to that, just metaphorically, not literally. Let my father be equal to a broken mirror. In fact, if you're ever stuck, you can just generate a whole lot of metaphors really fast and then just see which ones speak to you. And then I thought, if that's such a great idea, how come nobody has ever invented a way to just generate a whole bunch of metaphors really fast? And then you get one, oh, my father is a broken mirror. And suddenly now that's your metaphor, and now your job is to just explore it. My father is a broken mirror, which is to say, although shattered, I can still see myself in some of the pieces. Well, now there is a way to generate lots of metaphors, and it's called metaphor dice. <laughs> metaphor dice, when you have it your way? No. So what I have here is 12 dice. I've got four red, these are the big concepts, and the blue are the small objects, because a metaphor is sort of a temporary equation between a concept and an object. Let this idea be equal to this thing. And then the white are the adjectives. My heart, no, I don't like that one. My heart is an unruly mirror. The poem writes itself. The world is an unspoken wedding gown. Beauty is the unofficial destroyer. Happiness is an impossible wasteland. My heart is an unruly mirror, which is to say, it dances naked with a hairbrush as a microphone when it thinks no one's looking. These are, I've been told, game changers. I'm leaving this here so you can do some work. Do some work, awesome. yeah. Thank right. you. Put your hands together for Rona Alexander. <laughs> and while you're clapping, put your hands together for Terry, who is 
handling the sound. It sounds wonderful up here. Thank you so much. And while you're in a grateful mood, clap for the Van Andel Institute, putting this on for the first year. Hope you do this next year as well. No need to start at 7.30. That's just, <laughs> that's just, that's wrong. See, that's my biggest applause line yet. Take note. Tara, you taking notes? So I've come to the last section of my talk. I'm going to read my, the oldest poems, and these come from, oh, I said I read from that, but no, that's not true. I read from this first, the last time as we are, bouquet of red flags. I'm going to read uh, three poems now from What Learning Leaves, and the first is this poem that you saw on YouTube, and maybe many people have seen this on YouTube or been sent the email version of this. This is called What Teachers Make, or Objection Overruled, or If Things Don't Work Out, You Can Always Go to Law School. <laughs> Wait, is there anybody who would like to videotape this for personal use? I see cameras going up. Do you want to? You want to get a video of this? Okay, I'll do something else first, and I want you to come to the front row. Yeah. Anybody who wants to film this on their phone because the world needs another crappy video of me <laughs> performing what teachers make, come down to the front row. Absolutely, come, come film it. Come down, come down. Maybe she's the only one. I don't know. All right, I'll read. Well, if you're the only one. All right, I'll, I'll perform it right to you. In fact, give me the phone. I'll, I'll. I want the camera. All right. There, and now how do I turn it on to me? Right there. Right there. Okay. Samsung, almost as good as an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll perform it right now. I'm going to put it here. Can I use my, no. Yes, yes, look at that. Oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> Red button. Today is, whatever today is, uh, Monday, July 16th, 2018, and I am at the Van Andel uh, Education Institute in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan. There is a Grand Rapids, Ohio. Uh, I am not, get out. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to perform uh, What Teachers Make. Um, here are the people who are here. It is 8.20 in the morning. Go ahead, clap. These are the teachers who are here for the Institute. Um, I'm going to perform uh, what teachers make. I am requesting that this not go on YouTube. All right? And if it does go on YouTube, that is the woman whose camera it belongs to. You totally can put this on YouTube if you want. What teachers make, or objection overruled, or if things don't work out, you can always go to law school. He says the problem with teachers is what's a kid going to learn from someone who decided that his best option in life was to become a teacher? I'm sorry. <laughs> he reminds the other dinner guests that it's true what they say about teachers, those who can do and those who can't teach. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. I decide to bite my tongue instead of his <laughs> and resist the urge to remind the other dinner guests that it's also true what they say about lawyers because we're eating after all and this is supposed to be polite conversation i mean you're a teacher taylor come on be honest what do you make and i wish he hadn't done that asked me to be honest because you see i've got this little policy in my classroom about honesty and ass kicking which is if you ask for it well then i have to let you have it you want to know what i make 
I make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. I can make a C plus feel like a Congressional Medal of Honor, and I can make an A minus feel like a slap in the face. How dare you waste my time with anything less than your very best. I make kids sit through 40 minutes of study hall in absolute no, you may not work in groups. No, you cannot ask me a question, so put your hand down. Why won't I let you go to the bathroom? Because you're bored, and you don't really have to go to the bathroom, do you? I make parents tremble in fear when I call home at around dinner time. Hi, this is Mr. Molly. I hope I haven't called at a bad time. I just wanted to talk to you about something that your son said today in class to the biggest bully in the grade. He said, hey, why don't you leave that kid alone? I still cry sometimes, don't you? And that was the noblest act of courage that I have ever seen. I make parents see their children for who they are and who they can be. You want to know what I make? I make kids wonder. I make them question. I make them criticize. I make them apologize and mean it. I make them write, 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 and then I make them read. I make them spell definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, define nightly, be a beautiful until they will never misspell either one of those words. Again, I make them show all their words in math class and then hide it on their final drafts in English. I make them realize that if you've got this, then you follow this. And if somebody ever tries to judge you based on what you make, you give them this. Here, let me break it down for you so you know what I say is true. Teachers, teachers make a difference. Now what about you? Thank you. I'm teaching a poetry workshop later this afternoon. I think maybe you've already signed up for it, so maybe I shouldn't announce it here. But the world has been deprived of many great works of art because they were supposed to be created by teachers who thought they would have time after they had done all their grading and all their chores at home fed their family. Never mind your family. Your family can take care of itself. <laughs> it's just so hard. So here's my, here's my last poem. I'm looking forward to, to that workshop this afternoon. Um, it's a real poetry workshop. You don't have to have a poem. It's going to be generative. We will create poems right there, and then we will talk about them. It will be wonderful. Um, even though there will likely be no beer. Um, so thank you for, for, for uh, being here. Thank you for doing what you do. And here's my final poem. This is dedicated to anyone who is going to have to grade any student writing anytime soon. And this is where... Rona Alexander is going to earn her money if they are, in fact, paying her for this. <laughs> if not, go to RonaAlexander.com. That has two A's awkwardly in the middle of it. Rona Alexander. Thank you so much. This is called The, the Impotence of proofreading. Has this ever happened to you? You work very, very hard on a paper for English clash and then get a very glow raid on it like a D or even a D equals. <laughs> and all because you are the liverwurst spoiler in the whale wide word. Yes, proofreading your peppers is a matter of the, the utmost impotence. <laughs> now this is a problem that affects manly, manly students all over the word. I myself was such a bed spiller once upon a term that my English torturer in my sophomoric year, Mrs. Myth, she said I was never going to get into a good colleague. And that's all I wanted. That's all any kid wants at that age, just to get 
into a good colleague. <laughs> and not just anal community colleague. Because I am not the kind of guy who would be happy at just anal community colleague. I need to be challenged. Challenged menstrually. I need a place that can offer me intellectual simulation. So I know this probably makes me sound like a stereo, but I really felt that I could get into an ivory legal colleague. So if I did not improvement, then gone would be my dream of going to Harvard, jail, or prison. You know, in prison, New Jersey. So I got myself a spell checker, so I figured I was on Sleazy Street. But there are several missed aches that a spell checker can't, can't, catch, catch. For instance, if you accidentally leave out word, your spell check off won't put it in for you. And God, for billing purposes only, you should have serial problems with Tory spelling. Your spell check off may end up using a word that you had absolutely no detention of using. Because, I mean, what do you want it to douche? <laughs> no, it only does what you tell it to douche. You're the one who's sitting in front of the computer screen with your hand on the mouth going, clit, clit, clit. <laughs> It just goes to show you how embargo one careless little clit of the mouth can be, which reminds me of this one time during my junior mint. The teacher took the essay that I had written on a sale of two titties, and she read, no, I'm serial, I am serial. She read it out loud in front of all of my ass mates. It was quite possibly one of the most humidifying experiences of my entire life being laughed at like that pubically. <laughs> so do yourself a flavor and follow these two Pisces of advice. One, there is no prostitute for careful editing of your own work. No prostitute whatsoever. And three, when it comes to proofreading, the red penis, your friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will see you out in the lobby. God bless you. Thank you for doing what you do.